great to be here with you today in Dublin. Um, I was uh, born in Baghdad, Iraq, and uh, went over to England when I was a little kid, but went back to Iraq between the ages of 7 and 14, where I experienced Saddam Hussein's Iraq with lots of interesting uh, uh, moments. In my wildest imagination, I wouldn't have uh, thought that I would end up being in a company of more than 400,000 people, uh, operating in more than 50 countries, uh, serving more than 40-something industry subsegments with dozens and dozens of services. Uh, and actually, uh, my conversation with you this morning is a little bit about imagination and human imagination. So in order to bring that to life, let me just talk to you about some movies. So it's very hard for me to see you actually with these lights here, but just give me a show of hands if anyone's seen this movie here, Gattaca. Yeah, quite a lot. So, so you'll remember that Gattaca was about uh, eugenics uh, and the human genes and genes defining your class in society. So if you were um, Jude Law, that was good. If you were Ethan Hawke, that was bad. Um, and anyway, it was a very interesting story for those of you who haven't watched it. But today we have something called CRISPR. And again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with CRISPR technology, but CRISPR is a gene editing technology. And particular parts of that that have really moved a lot in the last few years, uh, such that you can now go into a gene, take a sequence of, of genes out, put another set in without damaging the overall function of the gene, which is a very big deal. It's different from what we had in the past. It means that people can start working on things like curing fungal attacks on wheat uh, for growing plants, but, and for t tackling congenital blindness and various other positive uses of technology. And, if, and uh, the way it works is you have developers in MIT who can write code where the output of the code is a gene sequence that's embedded in a virus that you can then implant that virus into an organism to propagate the, the gene code. It doesn't take a huge imagination to think about positive and negative implications of those sorts of technologies. But to summarize briefly, when we coded the first human genome, sequenced the first human genome in the year 2000, it cost $2.7 billion. Today, you can do that for $800. So $2.7 billion in, eight, in 2000, $800 now. And in fact, my nanny can go on to 23andMe, send a saliva swab to them, and find out about her own cancer and other risk factors due to her own genetics. And of course, when I, when I say my nanny, I, I'm referring not, not to my nanny, but for the, for the kids. Um, so again, some of you will have remembered this movie, Star Wars. And again, you know, generations of children have grown up and, and, and also their parents, you know, obsessed with the, you know, the various episodes over time. Today, you have a company called Boston Dynamics. Uh, and with Boston Dynamics, the, the robot technology has moved massively uh, in the last few years again, in terms of what it can do. And when you see the running dog go, it's actually scary at the pace at which it can go. If you look at the handle robot that can move on a camber on snow and ice, carrying loads of 40 to 50 kilos with incredible precision, and jump across obstacles as it goes, untethered and with no beacons, you get a sense of where this robotics technology is going. And again, it has a very massive array uh, of possibilities in terms of how we can use it in society and business today. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this one, Knight Rider, but this was like an annoying guy, Hoffman, who kept getting himself into trouble, you know, pointlessly, and had to be rescued by his car, Kit. But of course, you can do that as well today by, um, you know, using, you're dialing up your Nissan Nismo or any number of other autonomous vehicles, using your Apple Watch or other wearables to call the car to come and rescue you as well. Uh, and again, this technology literally is available now where we can go and get it. How many of you have seen this movie, Her? Okay, so about a third, I'm guessing. So, so this movie is about artificial intelligence. And again, as you know, mainly in the movies, artificial intelligence is trying to kill you. Uh, you know, like the Terminator and Ex Machina and so on. That's not the case here. In this movie, uh, the guy falls in love with his operating system because she displayed empathy and she listened to him. Uh, and apparently that isn't always the case uh, in relationships. Uh, and and so, <laughs> so, so, again, you sort of laugh and say, well, you know, artificial intelligence, but isn't artificial intelligence just for like automating routine, boring, repetitive tasks? Um, yeah. But, but where is it going? Well, actually, you'll find that there's a ton of VC money right now going into artificial emotional intelligence companies. Um, and, and I find that very curious. I mean, so if you'd asked us just two or three years ago and say, what was the dominant form factor for the internet, the way in which we interact with the internet? It would have been the smartphone. You know, we're all used to tapping and scrolling. But today, I mean, many of you will have the Amazon Echo or any number of others from Apple and Google and, and others in your home today where people are speaking to the internet. So, this business about how do I 
converse with the internet is absolutely becoming the dominant form, uh, and we're going to see that massively accelerate over the coming years. And so you can go and get tool sets from different developers, like the guys who wrote Siri, and now I've got a company called Viv, and, and those tool sets allow you to take any application, whatever it is, and, and build an interface for, for speaking. And so for anyone who grew up doing visual design, web design, and so on, where the various forms of user interfaces, you know, now we have to get used to this, this, this new approach. Sophia from Hanson Robotics. When you, when you meet Sophia and you touch her skin, her skin feels like real skin. I mean, it really feels like skin. And um, she's got 40 or 50 motors and actuators behind her skin, so that when you talk to Sophia, there's a machine learning algorithm there behind that allows her to display real empathy on her face. So back to my uh, artificial emotional intelligence. And you'll say, well, come on. I mean, you know, is it, this is scary or it's weird, and you know, maybe. But of course, the company will ship 100 Sophias in 2018, and then they'll, then they'll ship 1,000 Sophias in, in 2019, and then after that, it'll be much, much bigger. And so any kind of application where a human wants to be greeted or welcomed at a kiosk or a hotel front desk or whatever, you can imagine a very wide array of applications for this kind of humanoid robotics that is, that is incredible. Uh, and again, you know, back to this emotional thing, it's not that Sophia feels emotions. I mean, of course, that's nonsense. But her ability to mimic um, human behaviors in, in her face and, and, and the way she displays her features can be incredibly compelling and convincing. Uh, and so when um, certain intelligence agencies train an infrared camera on your face to, to track the subsurface blood flows, and they can t um, mirror those with machine learning to understand, you know, are you telling the truth or are you lying? It's the modern day polygraph test. It's not that the machine is, uh, is emotionally intelligent, but by golly, uh, they can start to simulate a lot of what you know, human interaction is all about. Total Recall, this is a, a, anyone remember this movie, Total Recall? So, so this one was a very confusing plot for those of you who, who remember it. You know, Schwarzenegger had like this problem with memory implants and he wasn't sure if he was Hauser or Quaid, you know, whether he was a good guy or a spy for the government. But the real bad guy was Kohagen who was trying to terraform Mars uh, and take control of the atmosphere you know, for mining purposes, you know, extracting resources. Uh, and again, you know, our new guy uh, today, the bad guy is this guy, uh, Elon Musk, for those of you who don't know him. So, so Elon Musk is indeed putting payloads into space using purely private capital. If you go back 20 years and say, look, we're going to ship payloads into space with no government funding at all, you'd say, like, it's impossible. Well, it, they're doing it. They're, they're doing it today. Uh, and NASA, indeed, pay him billions of dollars to do stuff because they don't have a shuttle program that works anymore. Uh, and, and, and this guy's doing that. And he does talk a lot about terraforming Mars. And he says that he wants to die on Mars, and he's deadly serious. And I'm sure that he doesn't mean on impact. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to slow down, you know, when there's no atmosphere. Uh, and and his, his next venture, which again I encourage you to look at if you're interested, is this thing called Neuralink, which is a, a bit like a, a Harry Potter wizard hat with tons and tons of tiny sensors in the neocortex to help understand what's going on. And again, you'll say, look, that's crazy. They're never going to upload your consciousness into the cloud, and we're not going to have to deal with that. Yes, maybe. But, um, you know, even with today's AI, you can put um, a hat on a human that measures the, the brain waves externally, the, the electric sensing. And if you keep showing the human pictures of a cat, the machine learning will learn when you're seeing a cat. And it turns out that we're not so unique. You can then move the hat to another human, uh, and you can tell what they're thinking when they see certain objects and things. And that, that technology is there right now. Uh, and so you know, I find it a little bit curious. And of course, we can, we can go through dozens and dozens of examples of the applications of these AI and machine learning technologies, but they basically are pervasive. They, they literally affect every single sector where any information flows. Uh, and um, you know, sitting where I sit in Accenture, looking at all the innovations that we work on with our clients, that is um, very challenging to think about, well, where is this all going, and you know, what do we do with it? So to cut a long story short, it's like, why is this happening? You know, what's, what's going on? And basically, it's logarithmic cost reduction, meaning that the zeros are dropping off the vertical axis in short order. So it's not just cloud computing and technology that's impacted, but any sector that, that flows information can be impacted, which of course is all of them, you know, every single sector. And we work with asset intensive industries like oil and gas and um, water and so on, and, and they also are seeing some of the effects of these cost reductions. And, um, having grown up in the resources industries myself, I was very surprised to find that electric vehicle battery packs, 
photovoltaic solar cells, the cost reduction in those technologies since the year 2000 has actually been sharper than in cloud storage. So of course, when that happens, those, that economic shift starts to upend industries. It, 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 it changes the dynamics of how costs are allocated across a value chain in an industry that allow the whole industry to be reformed and redone. And indeed, that is what we're seeing. So, you know, what was once the, the zone of human imagination and sci-fi is actually here now. It's underpinned by this incredible logarithmic cost reduction in technology after technology. I won't go through my list with you, but it's in drones, it's in robotics. Um, you know, the smartphone one always amazes me. In 2007, a state-of-the-art smartphone cost components was $500. By 2014, that was like $10, you know, massively down. And in 2007, you'd have been happy to have any camera on your phone, and now you want 12 megabits on the front and the back, if not more. The, the LiDAR detector on top of a, a, an autonomous vehicle, a car. So this is the thing that senses the surrounds of, of the car. Again, in 2009, that cost $30,000. And all the car manufacturers said, look, there's no ways that can be commercialized because you can't price that in to the price of a car. Well, by 2014, that same componentry cost $80. So, of course, now every car manufacturer is working on its own versions of autonomous vehicles, either alone or with some of the big software digital giants. And so, this thing called, that we call disruption is, is underpinned by a shift from imagination, human imagination, into you know, just the underlying innovation that is facilitated by this logarithmic cost reduction. And so, disruption is what? It's innovation meets an existing, older business model. That's what disruption is. So when the innovation comes along and it meets an existing business model that's locked in a particular way of doing things in the core business of a company, you get disruption. And so when I say disruption, people immediately think of what we call explosive or big bang disruption. So this is TomTom you know, meets Google Maps. That's a problem for navigation systems. Um, or uh, the folks who used to um, provide heat and light through whale oil you know, meeting electrification or the folks who were shipping ice around the planet after digging it out of the lakes in Minnesota, you know, following refrigeration. That's kind of explosive disruption. A whole industry goes away because the new way of doing it is just better, faster, cheaper, and there's no point doing it the way it was done before. It turns out that's not the most common form of disruption at all. The most common form of disruption is the chart on the right-hand side, um, which is, we call it compressive disruption, where the profits and cash flows of a company just get squeezed over time. So we still ship today similar volumes of desktop and laptop PCs as we ever did, just at a very much slower growth rate, um, and you know, while the smartphones exploded. And what's the big deal? Well, the big deal with that is when you're not growing at that same pace, the, the number of players who are in the place are competing for a smaller growing pie that forces compression of profits and cash flows, which reduces investment capacity. And so if you buy that, you know, every business has a core where it grew up, where it does what it does, but over time these innovations give emergence to a new. If I haven't got investment capacity, I can't make the trip from the core to the new. And a job of any business leader is to figure out not just where the new is, because actually most CEOs know exactly where it is. Kodak knew about digital photography. You know, Nokia knew about smartphones. They just couldn't get there because they're locked and glued to their core business. And it's super hard to figure out, well, how do I shift from the core to the new? And it turns out that disruption is um, an effect that isn't a once and done thing. It's a cycle that has always been there. It just accelerates in the world of logarithmic cost reduction of technology and the innovations that spring from that. And so we, we went away and we plotted and we said, if you look at the existing disruptability of industries, so in other words, what's actually happening to their revenues and cash flows, and, 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 and again, you know, my point on compressive disruption, the reason it's tough is it's often a 20-year or a 30-year cycle, which vastly outlives a management team's life cycle. And so what you find is companies go through a period of big revenue growth, but no EBIT growth, no profit growth. And you know, the automotive sector is a classic example. Telco is an example. Utilities are an example. Insurance is an example. <coughs> they, they, they go through revenue growth, but it's empty revenue growth because you're not adding much profit. And if that happens, that means I'm not adding any investment capacity, which means that it's going to be harder for me to repurpose my existing expenses and line items and budgets from the core business to the new business. So I don't make the journey. And what we find when we plot 
current disruptability and future disruptability of industries is that they, they show up in different places. So sometimes you feel like you're in a period of stability, but actually over time, vulnerability emerges, either because there's tons of VC capital going into potential disruptors in that sector, or because of lack of investment in innovation and R&D in that sector, or because of the nature of how CapEx is being deployed. But you end up with companies getting into a zone of vulnerability before they then shoot off into the, the land of real volatility and disruption. And so there's a kind of a, a, a anti-clockwise cycle that goes here, industry by industry, and the message is, you know, no one is immune. So, so, so of course, I asked our folks in Accenture Research to say, um, given that we've gone and completely nailed our colors to the mast on this thing digital, which is all this new innovation, um, let's find the correlation between digital and financial performance. And you know, we have a series of metrics around leading and lagging financial indicators, and we say, well, presumably companies that are more digitally intensive you know, on the vertical axis are gonna be more high performing on a financial axis. And I was completely revolted to discover zero correlation, like none whatsoever. It was exactly the opposite of what I wanted, uh, and I was offended. But so, so I, I, um, I asked the researchers to go and dig deeper, and actually what we found is it was more subtle than that. 18% of companies, and we looked at several hundred companies across many sectors in many countries, 18% um, of companies were highly digital intensive, and they did indeed drive higher profit margins in their existing core business than their, than their comparables in their industry peer set. In other words, they're applying digital to boost the, the profitability through automation of the existing business model. But only 6% of companies fell into the top right quadrant there of companies who um, we're using digital not just to optimize the existing business model, but also to invent and drive revenues from a new business model. Uh, and that is actually turns out to be very hard to do. So we've tried to say, well, what is it that the winners do? And it turns out they do four things concurrently over time. And again, this is not a journey in a sequence. These are four things that, that they do all the time. And as I, I'll give a couple of examples here, but just to be clear, this is not an endorsement of a company. It's not even an endorsement of a single company's strategy, but it is an endorsement of a piece of a company strategy that certainly we believe you know, works. So, so what the companies that get this need for continual innovation and continual rotation from the core business to the new business, what they get is they get four things together. Firstly, they're applying the new innovation to transform their core business, to cut costs, to be more competitive, to drive up investment capacity. That is a massive deal. And so Mondelez will say, look, we want to take a billion dollars of cost out of the business over three years. How do we get that done? You know, and, and let's go. And what we're hearing now is more and more companies who have got the wolf at the door. So in retail and CPG, like it's Amazon, in telecoms equipment, it's Huawei. Companies facing those situations are saying, look, I've got a $50 billion cost base. I now need to not do incremental change. I need to take $10 billion out. And, and still deliver my core business, but with a fundamentally reset cost base. And that's the kind of thinking that these companies get into here. You know, Avianca is a big airline in Latin America, and they recognize that chatbots are very useful tools for human interaction. In the old days, um, you, you know, the job of a call center was to get the customer off the phone as fast as possible, and ideally tangle them up in an impossible nested menu of IVR system to really fundamentally annoy them so they go away and don't call us, that was the purpose of you know, call center systems. Now with chatbots, the answer is no. Now I can actually answer check-in requests or flight details quickly and free up agents to actually deal with the real customer issues that are more involved and need human interaction. And so that's a direction that we see a lot of companies going. The second part of the story is that they grow the core business. So they take digital technology and say, how do I use digital marketing and personalization to understand you as an individual and use that to drive my core business? So if I'm Amex, I'm gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna have a prepaid debit card. I always had a charge card, but now I'm gonna essentially give you a current account where you put money in at front, and then you can do checks and payments as normal. So now I'm disrupting banks, but I'm using digital technologies to create growth in my core business. Um, scaling the new. This is the super hard one. This is like, like I said, every CEO I speak to, which are many, they see the new business in their space. They really do. They all have been to Silicon Valley and Shenzhen, uh, and Berlin and, and Shoreditch, you know, or the docks, and, 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 and they see it. It's just how do you drive that into the core business? How do I make my company um, a real winner in applying innovation? And that's, again, difficult. And so um, Boston Scientific, who make medical equipment, looking at care pathways through a hospital, say, how do I take 
uh, chronic cardio cardiology patients, you know, chronic problems, and figure out and help hospitals understand when they've got to be in, when they've got to stay in, when they can be discharged, what can I do afterwards for, you know, for, for home-based care to optimize the experience for the customer and also manage the cost of a burgeoning uh, healthcare system. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the heart of it all, the, you know, the fourth element is what we call the wise pivot. You know, every company is investing in its core business, but it's also got to invest in the new business. Companies that spread themselves too thin across too many dimensions, you just cannot afford all that investment. Uh, and so making choices about what, what's really the heart of my core and what's the most urgent part of the new and how do I allocate resources, that that's takes a lot of courage around capital allocation and investment management. And what people don't realize about companies like GE is they've exited literally half of their revenues in the last six years um, in order to focus on becoming a more digital and platform-based industrial equipment company. Um, when when, Mo when uh, Microsoft took a $7.6 billion write-off on their, on their mobile device equipment. Again, that, that was a very difficult decision to make, you know, and they went there um, and, in managing this wise, wise pivot. So what we find is it takes a tremendous level of courage to execute that. So I'm gonna summarize and wrap. It turns out that the sci-fi that you saw in the movies that we thought was for the far future just a few years ago, it's here now. Um, and it causes disruption because that innovation meets existing business models and causes disruption. And it's a challenge for big businesses because they're glued to their core business and they find it very hard to make the pivot into the new. Having said that, all that innovation is available at super low cost because you can access the, 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 the AI and the, and the cloud technology through simple programming interfaces at very reasonable cost. Any company is available. The steps required, the elements have required to get advantage of the innovation to move to the new are well known to us today. But the heart of it all is courage. It takes real incredible insight and courage of the top level people and companies and frankly throughout the ranks to make these shifts, to be willing to be open to all the new. But with that, I believe we can achieve anything. Thank you ever so much.